I, I imagine all of you know a little bit about uh, about this this project, uh, this effort, uh, which is why you're here. But I should say that uh, actually, I think just a few hours ago, uh, we officially launched the DVRC. The, the Devo Road Central Initiative, and that is a, a coalition of various, uh, well, it's a nonprofit uh, coalition of various uh, uh, groups and entities across the kind of spectrum of, of, of environmental NGOs, uh, people from the property sector, uh, commercial design, planning, uh, and other civic, uh, civically minded uh, entities to push forward a plan, first proposed actually in 2000 by the Hong Kong Institute of Planners, to turn Devo Road Central into a pedestrian and tram precinct. Uh, this proposal was refloated again uh, last year and has now been sort of expanded into the DVRC um, initiative, which is uh, why we're why we're here today. Now, uh, there's we are uh, launching the new DVRC website today, uh, dvrc.hk. Uh, and so after you sign up for your Asia Society membership, please go, go to dvrc.hk and you can sign, uh, sign up for uh, the, uh, the, to sort of stay up to date on, on, on the activities. But uh, the, there's a lot more information on there with the sort of transportation studies, the air quality studies, all sorts of data. So we, we, we really invite you to go have a look at those kind of technical and other uh, uh, pragmatic and regulatory issues that, that, that come along with this proposal to pedestrianize uh, Devo Road Central and, uh, and how those will be addressed. But at the same time, we want to expand the way we think of this uh, th this effort to go beyond uh, air quality, traffic, to really look at quality of life, uh, public realm in Hong Kong, and the pot potential for uh, for creativity, urban urban innovation, uh, and to really uh, ask a question the kind the uh, ask a question about the kind of city Hong Kong really wants to be, uh, whether it's one that is uh, technocratically uh, driven to create technocratic spaces or one that can move beyond on that to become more forward-looking, uh, innovative, and people-centered. Now, as part of that, we have uh, launched a collaboration as well uh, between uh, uh, the Faculty of Architecture at Hong Kong University and the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University. And we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, the leaders of those of, 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 of both sides uh, here today with us uh, to, to talk about what they're doing. Uh, but to very shortly summarize, they will be working together, uh, Columbia Studio X and, Hong and, and uh, Eric Schuldenfrey's uh, MA level uh, studio at Hong Kong U to look at uh, urbanistic and design possibilities uh, for Devo Road Central as a way of proposing new conceptual approaches. It's really, uh, as, as I said earlier today, the beginning of the beginning, uh, a way of opening uh, opening, uh, just opening the, the topic up to, to any number of ideas and approaches and alternatives to get the conversation started. Uh, and we plan in December to present the results of their research uh, to give uh, members of the public and, 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 and others uh, a chance to respond uh, and react and, 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 and provide feedback. And then after that, uh, if, uh, uh, if if all goes well, uh, we can begin a more uh, formalized process for design development that involves all the stakeholders to develop a, uh, a an imaginative, visionary, but also feasible uh, proposal for pedestrianized Devo Road Central. So to begin, uh, Jeffrey Johnson uh, of, of Columbia, uh, who is the di founding director of Columbia's Asia Mega Cities Lab, as well as director of Studio X, uh, or, or the, the, the Studio X think tank that uh, focusing on, on, on East Asia, is going to give a little preview. And again, please, please remember, they've only been working on this for about three weeks. So this is really just a, a preview of some of the approaches they're taking, followed by Eric Schuldenfrey, who will talk about his students. Uh, work, uh, and then we'll do a, 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 a brief discussion with uh, several other panel members and then uh, leave time for questions later. So please welcome Jeffrey. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, it's, very, it's very exciting to um, be participating on such a sort of ambitious um, project in such an amazing city of Hong Kong. So. Um, it's also you know, a great opportunity for us to continue uh, developing our relationship here uh, and also with, with Hong Kong U and working with, with Eric Schuldenfrey uh, and everybody there. Um, uh, again, so, so we're, we're already, we know it will be a sort of uh, very positive uh, experience for us and, and promising, I hope, also for, for everybody else. Um, sorry. Uh, DeVoe Road, as, 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 as 
Eric Chen um, was introducing we've started the process uh, a number of weeks ago today I'll just briefly describe our process of how how we're in, engaging with the project itself um, and which started with a, with extensive sort of research and analysis uh, of the urban scale of DeVoe Road um, and as we as we found uh, in, in our research of course the DeVoe Road has a very rich and unique uh, history uh, and we really feel that uh, that it has the potential to become sort of a new landmark uh, in a new history for for Hong Kong in public space. We feel definitely that the potential for the transformation of DeVoe Road uh, can really be a, a catalyst uh, for evolution, uh, certainly within the central area uh, and along DeVoe Road. Um, you know, it's part of our part of our research. Uh, also includes looking at other great public spaces uh, around the world and other projects that are very similar. I uh, won't go into to detail today about them, but it again, the potential, uh, again, for increasing the quality of, of life within the center part of Hong Kong uh, is, is definitely there, but also to create, again, a great destination for not only the, the public of Hong Kong, but again, also for visitors and tourists, etc. Again, the, the, situa the, the siting of DeVoe Road, again, in a very central location, is very prime, uh, again, for, for sort of catalyzing a sort of evolution, again, towards a sort of human-centric, pedestrian-centric way of thinking about life with, within the city, and certainly within the city like Hong Kong, with super, super density, um, et cetera. And its proximity also to sort of a network of public spaces, a network of uh, pedestrian spaces, and also its network uh, um, to Kowloon, et cetera. Um, amazingly, and, and, and many of you are aware, but, but the sort of uh, evolution, the physical evolution of DeVoe Road is also very unique, and that's also part of our research. It's really understanding that, that a century ago or so or before, DeVoe Road was actually in the water, so in the harbor, and that over a series of time, and I don't go through all of the, the details, but the extension and the reclamation of land has now centralized sort of DeVoe Road. So it's very interesting, and we look at the sort of physical kind of condition and evolution of DeVoe Road and as it, as it will help and inform us as we think about it uh, in, in, in the future. Again, here you see an amazing, it's very inspiring image. Again, it's looking in the, in the past, but here DeVoe Road is as along the harbor itself and as it was along uh, uh, the seaport, 1870. So again, a long time ago and it's gone through many evolutions, but a very interesting history so that we've been analyzing. Also important to, to our research is, again, the field study and analysis of what we're doing. So building a basic user type and constituent based of who, who, uses, who uses the road now and who, who is potential to be using the road in the future. So again, that's very important for us and with our, and our, with our team uh, as we develop the ideas as we move forward. Also, uses are very important um, because what happens inside the buildings that basically bracket either side of DeVoe Road is important, not only for the vitality and the future of the street itself, but also to create sort of kind of a, a dialogue between what happens in the street and what happens in the building, which I think then Eric Schuldenfrey will talk of, about with Hong Kong use, thinking within the architecture of the street. Also, we, we looked sort of at moments of intensity along the, the street at different times of the day, basically, because that's also something that can tell us not only something about as the road and the street exists today, but how we might want to propose the future of the road, thinking about use and intensity. And obviously, the stretch of DeVoe Road Central that we're, we're looking at actually has, a, has an extreme kind of gradient of users from Central uh, to Sheng Wan and the Western Market, uh, again. So it's a very diverse stretch of, of the street itself. Again, as I said a bit previously, it's, it's looking also within the context of the potential of the street uh, against other uh, sort of international examples. So here it's just looking at scale uh, with potential within these streets. So again, a lot of our research up to this time has to do with, again, the possible compare and contrast um, to itself. And we know the High Line, go into this, but we've done a series of anal analytical kind of um, uh, precedent studies for the potential, again, to sort of bring to light what the potential of the street can do. Certainly, again, as a transformer catalyst uh, for change. Times Square, um, again, won't go into a lot of detail, but again, we see here that, the, the uh, again, the role of these sort of transformations and sort of changing uh, the civic space around in the public space. 
Also really important to, to how we're thinking about the, the project also has to do with sort of green technologies and thinking about air quality, et cetera, and what we might propose to implement within that long, the length of the street that, that also, uh, in a way, is a more intelligent way of thinking about design as we move forward, not only in public space, but again, ways of thinking about a more sustainable future. So we're looking in the technologies and what kind of examples we can find uh, that, that would prove to be good examples. Again, I won't go into detail, but just some examples that in some cases are, 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 are more foreign sort of projects. They're also temporary structures, but the difference between sort of uh, something from street furniture all the way to a sort of pavilion or something constructed uh, can really uh, um, create a sort of uh, a more sustainable way of thinking about uh, sort of uh, sustainable infrastructures along the street. Canopies, and of, of course, with the climate, we've considered... Uh, the climate of Hong Kong is very important, so it's, it's very warm uh, and it's at times very wet. Uh, so the national coverage and canopy is very important to sort of the quality of public space uh, along with the air. So, so maybe just to quickly conclude sort of our part, this is starting to get towards the conceptual development. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief introduction to the way we're approaching the project. But now as we move forward and working with Hong Kong U, we're developing sort of a conceptual way of thinking about the street. And um, in December, the hope is then to offer a number of alternative ways of thinking about the street itself through its design. So right now, as our sort of uh, inspirations of thinking about the, the street, we've come up with really sort of six concepts or ideas that can help us push the design forward, inspire it. So the idea of a playground, the idea of interaction, uh, and sort of idea of public enjoyment within the street itself. The idea of the forest or a kind of oasis within, within this sort of, uh, uh, a sort of concrete jungle, right? And almost in a, a sort of respite from the sort of chaos of the city. The idea of a public theater, the sort of action on the street, the things that really activate it. The idea of carnival or spectacle or the idea that this can really activate uh, multiple kind of ways of programming along the street. Or the Galleria, again, this idea that a covered indoor-outdoor kind of space can also produce a kind of 24-hour kind of active of space itself. Or even an artscape. So this idea that this can become something that's driven culturally or curated uh, in its sort of, in, in role within the city uh, itself. So again, these are sort of six, six sort of concepts or ideas that we're moving forward and have applied sort of to the overall street itself into each of the zones. We have sort of six zones, and we hope to have sort of kind of six different approaches to, to offer to the general public uh, to get some feedback uh, in December. And each of those zones is a sort of sign, uh, assigned one of these uh, sort of concepts. So um, we're really looking forward to this. I think it's a great project. Uh, and um, yeah, we'll see where we are in, in December. Uh, Eric, thanks. Sam. Thank you, Jeffrey. We're very excited to be part of this initiative, and we're very excited to be working with Columbia University on this, and also uh, all our other partners. There's something about the site that really is exciting because we can actually start to see how we can start to change the city. It's not just the city that we inherit, but actually the city that we make a change to. And working with university students, you can actually see the imagination start to apply here. We have six different sites, as Jeffrey mentioned, that we're looking at, and we're looking at at various scales. And so we de deliberately chose sites that are enormous in, in terms of how much area that they take up, all the way down to a very small four-story building as well. So the six sites that I'll just really briefly take you through right now are really looking and examining how the streetscape that Jeffrey introduced might actually start to infiltrate and make their way up into the building. And so how does the architecture start to relate to the public space? And how do we form a dialogue with the street? You could imagine that if you are building a city, and if you're building a structure, an architecture, and it's relating to a city full of cars, uh, that you might actually design very differently in terms of how you develop that city. Whereas as you start to imagine building the city according to a park or according to having frontage of green space, that you'd actually radically change how you approach design. And that's the question the studio asks, is really how are we going to change design according to this new site sort of paradigm? 
So with this, we took a look at what is existing in some of these cases. And you can see that there are spaces within the city that are less desirable. There are spaces in the city that actually haven't fulfilled their promise or their potential. And so it's spaces like this where you start to pair the space itself and the reality of the space that we found with the, the, some even just the key words that Columbia has started to investigate. So key word like such as playground. And as soon as you start to apply one to the other, you start to realize that there's actually a mismatch. And so the architecture then starts to question where we operate. And where we operate might not just be Devoy Road, but it actually might be some of the other potential sites along the way. So in this case, for one of the groups of students, it's going to be all the back alley lanes around the way and see if there's actually a different type of architecture that can come from that and what those type of potentials are. So it's not just how this one street activates uh, that area. Um, it's actually how then it serves as a greater catalyst for the city on Palm itself, and how we can actually make even greater potential too. I'll show you a series of sketches. Uh, the students are working in pairs, so there's 12 students in total, and then there'll be six projects that pair with the different keywords that Columbia has also, uh, we've been working with Columbia to develop as well. So it's the idea too, if you're building a forest, what you might do to build up into the forest. So as Devo Road, as you can imagine, might actually start to become populated with trees in one part. Actually, how might you create a civic space within that? How you might start to enter the canopy of that, uh, canopy of that forest as well? Or if you're thinking about the theater, how would the theater start to interact both at the street level, but also how it might interact as you move up. And just as a pre-note, uh, as Eric Chen mentioned, we've only been looking at this for a few weeks now. So a lot of it was in background and case studies, and now we're just starting to have the idea of design as well. But we're also looking at what the city already has. And so in this case uh, with the theater, uh, this is very close to a municipal building that has really different programs per floor. So we're also trying to learn from the city itself the things that we think that already happen at a high level, at a very good way, and we're trying to then replicate those within the buildings. And then what are these other potentials uh, that the streetscape might allow for once you start to have greenery as it goes through? So it's things like in Carnival, we have this idea of transformation. So the students are starting to look at the site, not just as a static entity, but actually how through the course of the day it might open up. It might allow for different programs to come through or even in the evening. So if an office tower on the left uh, might actually transform into a theater space or other type of space uh, during the day. Of course, these are quite uh, innovative in terms of ideas, but we'll be working with engineers and others to see what is potential and what is actually just, at this moment, uh, speculation. And I think it's those type of challenges that we ask ourselves of how you might also work with the existing fabric and the existing structure. In one of the studies, uh, the students are looking at Central Market and also how that building might open up. What these other potentials of the site might allow for is preservation or conservation always done a certain way in Hong Kong? Can it only be done a certain way in Hong Kong? Or actually, can we start to challenge this as well, especially knowing how the streetscape might then have an infliction back onto the building itself? So just briefly, um, this is the, the overall uh, that we want to express. And we'll be looking, too, at good case studies in Hong Kong, things that were pioneering in their day that continue to be pioneering, and how we can, might actually even in an office tower, bring in art, bring in an artscape, bring in a central atrium, bring in daylight again, and really challenge if you're actually making change to the street, those changes to the street actually might start to think about how we make changes to the buildings as well. So of the six sites we have, um, there's different ones that actually start to apply into the buildings. Um, and so along the way, each one is really reacting to the different zones. Um, so that's just a really brief introduction. Um, thank you. I'll introduce briefly our, our, our panelists uh, going from your right to left, I guess. Uh, first is Paul, Paul Zimmerman, who is probably the person who, prob who really needs no introduction uh, here. Paul is a, um, a district councillor representing Pok Fu Lam here in Hong Kong, but also a long time, um, uh, let's say, civic, uh, civic figure uh, who, who is uh, the, the president as well of, of, of Designing Hong Kong. Uh, a nonprofit uh, in Hong Kong looking at uh, at ways of, of making the, ci the city more li livable. Um, net to Paul's right is uh, Donald Choi, the managing director of Nan Fung, uh, overseeing his uh, overseeing that company's real estate portfolio. And, and and we're especially happy to have Donald here because Nan Fung's headquarters happen to be right on Devo Road Central. So it'd be great to to get his uh, thoughts as a developer, but also uh, as as an as an end user potentially. 
And then we have Amal Andraus, who, uh, who is the Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning and Preservation at Columbia, who, is, who just arrived yesterday on, on a whirlwind tour of, uh, of, 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 of China and, and Hong Kong. And, and, and so we're, we're, we're very lucky to have been able to snag her. And then uh, Jeffrey and, and Eric, who you just, um, who you just heard from. Um, I thought maybe, uh, maybe Amal, we, we, I, I thought maybe we could start with you because uh, I, I'm sure many of you are, are, are looking at, uh, at, at Jeffrey and Eric's proposals and, and thinking how absolutely insane and crazy and, uh, and unrealistic they are. Um, I, I want to emphasize again that this is just, these are just uh, conceptual concepts that, uh, and conceptual approaches that, that they're working on. But Amal, I mean, you, um, you being a, an established architect in New York and someone who's lived in New York for a long time, you've seen uh, absolutely insane, or what was once thought to be insane, inconceivable uh, projects uh, ur ur urbanistically happen uh, in, in New York. I, I'm thinking in particular of the High Line, which, is, um, which, which many of you may know is a uh, disused elevated rail, uh, railway track that has now become one of the great, uh, great success stories not unproblematic, but, but, but success stories in terms of public space in the world. And that began with basically two, two or three guys who just had, a, you know, had this vision and, and, and no one ever thought it could ever happen, and, and, and now it has. And then the massive uh, pedestrianization of, of major thoroughfares in spaces like Times Square uh, in, in New York. Maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how you see that uh, applying here or, or, or not applying. Sure. Uh, to first to your point about the uh, the students' work. I mean, what's great about um, schools uh, is that there there's a kind of line uh, between the real and the and and the kind of uh, space of imagination. And they students are just kind of uh, nothing is impossible when you're drawing it. Uh, but at the same time, I think the school is interested in perforating that line and bringing some of the real questions to, to be explored. And so there's a lot of freedom uh, and it just opens up the conversation and I, I can see already uh, kind of potential. Uh, New York uh, has been it's interesting for a long time. It was the city where nothing was possible or rather everything was driven just by um, kind of developer uh, um, uh, uh, kind of interest, but um, uh, obviously the last 10-15 years has been a lot of kind of uh, vision and uh, um, from the High Line to, to other projects uh, and it was really the coming together of different constituents and uh, uh, a lot of support and it's it's at a moment where uh, the questions around uh, density cities and how, and how density and and open uh, public space are going and green space are going to to be able to to live together um, there's a real need for kind of visionary thinking but also practical implementation and kind of working together uh, to produce that. Another uh, kind of transformation that was uh, unthinkable uh, in New York was the bike lanes. I mean, who would have thought New Yorkers could bike? Uh, but they have been. And so, uh, again, I think there's a lot of possibility when uh, when different constituents come together and, and start to kind of imagine alternate uh, modes of being or of living in, in cities. And I think that this is where um, the initiative is quite interesting to just open up that conversation. Uh, may, maybe Donald, you can sort of respond to that. I I I, I know that you um, you're interested uh, in the, the the doability of proposals like these and and, and actually how they have ec how they may not look like it at first, but they actually bring uh, economic benefits. Maybe you can talk about that. Um. I understand that actually this proposal uh, has been uh, proposed back in 2000 already and a number of technical studies have been done um, that prove that you know, doing without the vehicular traffic uh, is possible and obviously uh, we have further evidence to show that during the occupation of Central uh, you know, the city becomes so much more enjoyable. Uh, and, you know, uh, I would look at it not only from an economic um, beneficial point of view. Uh, first of all, I think on a traffic management point of view, uh, it is doable 
uh, and it actually lead to quite a number of benefits, including you know the reduction of pollution, uh, better air, uh, less noise. Uh, we can have a green lung actually in our city center, which is very important. Um, the environmental benefit would lead to kind of a unique place making in Hong Kong, which we don't really have at this moment. Uh, and you know, from the commercial point of view, especially with the e-commerce and so on, um, we are always concerned about how we can make our place a destination that could provide a very enjoyable experience for shoppers, for users to come. And I couldn't imagine a better proposal than this. It really is something that will generate a lot of interest, uh, a lot of attraction, uh, not only for the tourists, but also for the locals and you know, uh, residents and user office worker. Uh, imagine you know, if I am working in one of these buildings and I am really working you know, within a park, I can go down, have a cup of coffee among the forest, uh, go to the gallery, you know, how enjoyable that would be. So, you know, from a business point of view, I think it is really a great proposal. So it has benefits in terms of Hong Kong's competitiveness uh, as well. M maybe, Paul, you can respond. Um, my second job in Hong Kong was on the Vaux Road in, bank, in the Bank of Bangkok, which is somewhere halfway. And um, I, learned, uh, I learned this lesson. I was in Hong Kong for about four months. And I learned this lesson from the guy that I was working for. He said, we have to go to this meeting. Don't look anybody in the eye when you walk on the street. Just look right above people's head so they won't bump into you. And that was his guide of how to uh, maneuver quickly through the crowded pavement of, uh, of the Vaux Road. Um, and I, I can see that uh, this, uh, the, once you pedestrianize this road, people's behavior in central will, will, will completely change. You will then, if you have to go east-west somehow in, in central, you will navigate your way down first to the Vaux Road, then follow the Vaux Road to like, navigate yourself off the Vaux Road and, and go wherever you have to go. So that will become the pedestrian corridor. It will naturally grow to be that way. Um, and so if you, if you do this, if we, and, and we can do this, and, and Donald already referred to it, um, the people that came up with the idea is none of us here on the, on, 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 the, uh, on the podium. Actually, the people are not here today who first came up with it in 2000. They realized looking at the um, massive amount of money we are spending on new transport infrastructure. The central ones are bypass. We'll move cars away from central towards the new waterfront. The... Um, New rail lines, the uh, West Island Line, the South Island Line, and the Central Sha Tin Link, they will all take people out of buses into the rail. So those two major changes will actually lead to an opportunity to reorganize traffic. Now, we're not going to take all the traffic out of Central. Uh, we had some media before, and they asked a the question, Who's gonna, what are you going to do with the traffic? And, in, you can see that the side roads, the crossroads, will continue to operate. So you can still go north-south, and you can take the main roads, uh, Queen's Road and uh, Connaught Road, to go east-west. You can't use the Vaux Road anymore unless uh, you take the tram or you take an, an electric bus. And I think all of, that, see, all of that is possible, and it will be a massive gain. I think uh, people that own buildings, on the side of the road. We've already got the list of all the owners. Most of them are single owned. Some of them are strata owned, which means that they're individual owners. Um, they should actually pay all of us for making it happen because the property value will go up dramatically. So, um, so and we'll, we'll, we'll promise you, we will we'll come to you and to all the other owners to ask for some money because we need it so we can do the, the studies that need to be done in terms of how do you reorganize traffic? How do you make that work? Uh, you know, and you gotta do some real s studies. Where's the new bus stop? You know, where, are, where are people gonna get off the bus when they come to work from the new territories on Monday morning? You gotta answer those questions. You gotta figure that out and that needs some hard work and we're gonna have to do that. Uh, we're also gonna have to pay for uh, further design development too. I don't wanna... 
I, I you want to your money for architecture too. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, maybe Eric and Jeffrey, you can um, describe a little bit more the the kind of creative process, right? Because I mean, Donald mentioned placemaking. Um, maybe discuss a little bit how you know how these are far out ideas become realities, and but 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 still exist in the core of of, of a concept to uh, to create these the notions of places. Well, I, I think you know one of the things that's that that's really important um, in in projects like Devoe Road, or at least an effort to make it more pedestrianized, um, and placemaking in public space, is that first and foremost you have to m make the public believe it's theirs, right, in some way, and that requires uh, you know some some level or multiple levels of engagement with it, and so. Um, I think in the way that we've started to think about the project is also in a way what what are ways that the way that we conceptualize it help enhance a level of engagement with public, right? So, um, and I think that's that's something that's uh, again very important uh, for the way that we're thinking about the project, um, and and how to make those kind of ideas come to fruition or a reality. You know, I think again, it's it's about a certain level of of you have a certain level of believability within the sort of big idea as well. And I think you know, most things become uh, the project becomes most dangerous when it becomes more convincing, right? And I think in some ways, and, and so right now we're kind of at that level. Let's just get some ideas and we're brainstorming and what's possible. But there is a part that you know that that level of making it believable is is when you know it's going to be something that's really dangerous. So, so we have to think about that, right? And what does that mean? Is it feasible? Can you build it? It's, you know, all kinds of things. It's, it's very complex. And we're probably not going to even hit the surface of those in this first couple of months of this study at the beginning of the beginning. But you have to get buy-in, right? You have to make it exciting. You have to people feel like this will be theirs. And, and as we saw, you know, even in our initial research, that it isn't a single type of user. Right, so the public is actually very diverse, and even the public that's diverse along the stretch of Devoe Road Central is very diverse. The spatial quality is very diverse. So this idea that that you approach design by feeling how do you deal both with the individual, but the individual also as part of a larger constituency, which is very diverse in a way. And I think that's also why we're thinking offer many op sort of alternatives because it will speak to many different people. And when you look at a land use map of Hong Kong, which maps out all the different territories and who is controlling what areas, you'll see that almost 75% of Hong Kong is actually green space in one form or another, or in nature, let's say, maybe not green, but some sort of natural space. The problem is, is that the 75% is actually a little bit out of reach. You can reach it if you take a transportation to get there, but it actually isn't in the center of the city. And when we looked at the area, we noticed that first that there aren't that many parks right in that area, and that it actually becomes less accessible. And that it isn't, a lot of these areas aren't accessible by public transportation either. And so if you really want to make use of the green space, it actually has to be right there next to you. Another thing that we start to notice is that it starts to change our thinking about buildings. It's not just our thinking about the streetscape, but it's also our thinking about how the buildings might transform to have a little bit more livable type of spaces. Often Hong Kong is very focused on the work aspects or the efficiency aspects to allow greater work to happen. But if you're working, the entire time, you might not be able to enjoy the city, to, might not be to the same livable effect that you might find elsewhere. I say this because I was living in New York City when they started to add uh, the strip along the waterfront that was all the green spaces that started to ring Manhattan. And when I saw it being built, I didn't think for a second that it would transform my life. I didn't even, I didn't even pay attention. But as soon as it was built, I would go every single day. And I didn't realize until it was built that I actually I needed it so much. And that it would actually allow for a different way of looking and using the city, let's say. And I found the same thing. I happened to be living in uh, New York City when the High Line first opened. And it transformed how I used uh, the space. In fact, I used to take the subway to the High Line. Um, and what was nice about that is you could always go to a different part of the High Line. And there are so many different opportunities along the way of the High Line that allows you to use different parts along the way. And working with Columbia on this, it really became uh, amazing in terms of the way that the project is being envisioned. Although it seems quite out of um, the ordinary, let's say, that if you start to transform parts into a raw forest, uh, 
instead of a park. So the idea of a forest instead of a park is actually very deliberate. Or if you start to fixate on the idea of a galleria and how you might actually change if you start to cover it, you might find passive ways uh, within terms of environmental controls to cool the space during the summer. So even just in terms of covering a small amount of space, you might actually think of different ways that we can start to engineer it to allow those spaces to be used year round. So all of a sudden, different potential for the architecture starts to evolve as well. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I would like to be a little bit more practical. <clears throat> uh, because the, the challenges that I have at hand is the question, where will be my bus stop? That's, uh, so as we try to uh, discuss how to realize this project, the question that comes up is, where's my bus stop, is the, is the main question. Uh, and the question within government is, so who will manage the space? And those who live in Hong Kong know the problem of Mong Kok. The only way to have resolved the management problem that we had in the street was to let the cars back in. And we only did that recently, that we opened up the road for cars to go back into Mong Kok so that we could solve the noise problem. So within, within government, we, um, we have, I think, good level of support at the higher levels. Um, within the transport department, who have to do the, the hard work, they have to uh, deliver it. Uh, there are some tough challenges uh, to convince them, but I think with some good studies we can do it. But the question that is now, so once we've done the job, then who will manage it? So, and we have to come up with, with answers to that. And we may have to look to other parts of the world um, in terms of business improvement district models where um, you know, the business gets involved in managing the street. However, new world development and Tim Chachoy waterfront. Uh, we just had the problem where uh, the developer says, I will fix the, new, the, the Tim Chachoy waterfront and then I will manage it. And then the whole community says, excuse me. <laughs> Get your hands off the Chim Chachoy waterfront, New World. So we gotta we gotta figure out within Hong Kong, we gotta have a debate on how we're gonna do that. So there's a debate about how do we manage the traffic and how we make the taxi drop-offs and the buses and the cross traffic work. And there is the debate how do we manage it in the future? And those are two very significant debates that we're gonna have. Um, I love to see how the buildings are gonna respond. I can see that the Hang Seng Bang ground floor is going to change its function. I can see that every building that have ground floor space is going to dramatically change the use of the ground floor space. I, you know, I can see all of these changes is going to take place uh, very quickly. And I, I, I think that, that the students who are going to focus on that are going to have a lovely time, especially if they look at existing buildings and see how they may respond to the, uh, to the changing in environment. Um, but I think that is, uh, you know, that is from a uh, getting it done point of view is not critical. Why we think it's fantastic that these design studios take place is because that aspiration that will come in and people look at it and they love it. The only thing that I'm a bit worried about in Hong Kong is uh, that it's going to look a glamorous opportunity for property where people then don't feel it's there anymore. And I think your biggest winners are um, the guy that makes $5,000 uh, carrying um, uh, letterhead to buildings from the little print shops, and he uses a trolley. I mean, these are the people that are going to win by not having to maneuver this, the, the, this, the, the, the cramped sidewalks. And I think there are more groups of people like that. The, the daily workers that use that space in Central have to go around. I think that's where we have to connect. So in, in any design work that we do and in communications and images, we got to connect to the local, local grassroots that, and their game. Because if they don't feel a game, we're not going to get there. I definitely support what Paul is um, advocating. Um, I mean, this project enable it to move forward. We must engage the public and all the stakeholders. Uh, it's not just a studio project. It's not just a, you no know, project to benefit the businessman or landowner around the area. Um, it's not just a project to improve uh, air quality and so on. Uh, we must engage all the stakeholders. And you know, public participation is important to get their buy-in. Um, ideas uh, obviously um, need to be very diverse and incorporated. Um, one thing that I think I am a little bit different from Paul is that, um, you know, obviously we must think out of the box. 
And in that sense, we couldn't use uh, old processes to manage our new ideas and um, you know, new initiative. Um, you now, how we manage it will be difficult, but I don't think we want to go back to what is existing and what can be done under the existing system. Uh, if that is the case, probably we will never get this project <laughs> off the ground. We need to think of an innovative processes and you know, get the, all the stakeholders behind it and you know, look at the you know, benefit and then we'll be able to change. I mean, uh, you know, uh, not, not to dwell on New York too much. We, we know New York and Hong Kong are, 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 are very different, but you know, in, in New York, the, 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 the way that a lot of these, these sort of bolder concepts got, were, uh, happened was because you had a very strong mayor, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who also had a very, who had very strong uh, commissioners of, of planning and transportation, both women uh, in traditionally men's fields, by the way, um, uh, who were able to have perhaps think outside the box a, 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 a little more easily. Um, fairly or not, uh, I think it's fair to say that it, it, it's, uh, it's not too, too, too crazy to say that, that uh, our government here in Hong Kong is probably not as known for, uh, for, for, for being strong and visionary and, 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 and so on and so forth. So that begs the question, you know, how do you get these uh, done and, and what are the opportunities, for example, with, uh, with private public or public private uh, uh, partnerships. I, I don't know if m maybe Paul or, or Donald, you have thoughts on this? Well, private-public partnerships is a dangerous word these days because that's what we, uh, that's what New World and LCSD have but called the, uh, the Chin Cha Chai waterfront yeah. promenade. So, but you know, the, yeah, no, it has to be common as part of engagement. Is how do you make it a, uh, a private people-public partnership? So the government, the community, and the business sector have to get involved in that discussion. And um, so I think it's good to see that today we have um, kind of participants from, from many different sides. So the design studio, the first design studio is here with ac more academic uh, architectural, but I think that we've got to have to do more design studios uh, with the community. We've got to go out and work with, uh, with different people to get them involved in the process. And that will make it a, a, a public-private partnership. Then how that then implements from a legal, technical that's a different issue. I mean, that once the people have agreed on what they can get out of it and how it can be done, then the implementation, I think, becomes um, becomes uh, easier. But people got to own first that vision. And, uh, you know, right now people see some nice pictures of some grass and a tram with people walking on the side of it. And that's what people have seen. And people have already responded positively, thanks to Mr. Sit. We just had a Mr. Sit who said, cancel the tram. And he made a rezoning application to get rid of the tram. So that was great. We thank Mr. Sit for that. Because everybody came out, thousands and thousands of people, and all the media said, we're not going to cancel the tram. So that have kind of popularized the issue. And now we've got to take people on to the next trip uh, of vis envisioning what that space, how it could work, and how it can work for them, and make them participants in, th in that thinking. Um, so if we see, look ahead, then we have district council elections, 22nd of November. We have uh, the new term of district council, the 1st of November. You guys finish in December. So I guess in 2016, we've got to really have community activities and get the community involved in, in a lot of this thinking. If, because before that might be a little bit difficult with the district council elections. Locking was that? Just to add to that too, I think it's also important to keep in mind who this is for, because although it's just Devoy Road in Central, because it connects with the MTR and because it connects with the larger city, anyone within and across Hong Kong can really use it. And so it becomes already another thing that's already very well integrated into the city. And so as you were speaking, Paul, I was thinking about who is this benefiting? And it seems like it actually can benefit a huge, pop, uh, huge amount of the population. And I was thinking about the stakeholders, about who do we ask their opinion of? And I think it really is uh, something that we need to open up to the larger population of Hong Kong, not just the people within the area, not just the person whose economic uh, viability is dependent on that area, but actually who might be eventually using it as well. This, this, I mean, if I go ahead, I don't want to occupy the floor here, but the, uh, there, are good, there is a good thing about the Vaux Road Central. Nobody lives there. 
Well, in Mong Kok, you had a lot of people living along the road. Here, nobody lives. I think there's one building that is now a, uh, a uh, an apartment, a surface apartment, a semi-hotel. But otherwise, there's nobody living there. So we don't have the Mong Kok thing of people throwing acid from the roof because it's too noisy. Um, so so that that's good. You know, so there is there is uh, the, 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 the group that is going to be very concerned as people that are going to be working there. I mean... Uh, one strategy is to have it it's somewhat take it from new york when they painted the streets they painted the widening of the footpaths rather than actually did it uh, in in hardscape um to test it out and we can do that in the fell road on, on the weekends we do chater road closing why not extend chater road closing all the way to western market on the weekends of public holidays there are no commuters so you don't have that bus loads the bus loads that you have to redirect you only have to redirect a little bit. And and I think that will open up an opportunity for people to experience what it could be like. And I think that will help. Then we recreate our mm. Occupy Central <laughs> sensation <laughs> on Sundays. <laughs> Suddenly no noise, you can hear the birds, you know, and I, you start recreating that. And then I think it will be easier to get people in, uh, engaged and, uh, and involved. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I, I think everything you're saying, Paul, is, is, is absolutely true. but. You know, I, I, the one thing I am not worried about is that practical, regulatory, and other issues will be brought up and and and, and have to be addressed, especially in Hong Kong. I mean, as as sure as as sure as the, the the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, issues about the bus stop, the questions about the bus stop, and so on and so forth will uh, will, will come up and 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 be dealt with. But I'm I, I'm wondering. I'd, I'd like to sort of take this beyond that uh, again as part of the the vision that will get people excited uh, and and. Uh, uh, and maybe building on, on what Eric was saying about how he didn't realize he needed uh, the park in, in, in New York in, in, until they built it. I mean, it, that's sort of like a classic uh, iPad moment, right? Like no, no one thought that, that anyone needed an iPad until they actually made it, and then now everybody needs one. I'm wondering maybe uh, one of the architects or designers can can, can talk about what uh, what design and architecture can do beyond the kind of more technical sort of uh, issues and, and, and bring other qualities of space. Or maybe Donald, you you, you mentioned, uh, you started with placemaking, but if you want to build on that. Well, I, I think, you know, I look at this project not just as a isolated project. It really could be the catalyst for, you know, better things to come to Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong being a congested city actually is great for you know, walkable urbanism. Uh, we haven't done that because the vehicular, especially the private car, has taken over our role. We need to reclaim back, you know, the role for public use, you know, for pedestrian-friendly environment. And we must not forget that, you know, technology has advanced, you know, so much from the past. Uh, we have driverless car that could be used. Um, you know, it could be a smart city where we know exactly where to stop and get on the bus. You know. um, why we need to work on the 23rd floor, you know, while a lot of the work can be done with mobile, um, you know, iPad and so on, we can actually come down to the street and work. I mean, we need to revisit what a city is for. Uh, is it just for efficiency or actually to create a place where we have a quality of life and to the standard that we want. And that is possible with all the new technologies and if we design it correctly, uh, we don't really need to uh, you know, isolate ourselves into one particular time zone or one particular workplace to you know, make our living. Uh, so so I, I think you know, in terms of design, I think we must think not with the past technology and the traditional way of working, living, and entertaining. We need to look at you know, the coming decades, what will happen you know, to our society. I'm curious on Ramal's take on this, because they, or her architecture office recently did a, um, a new workspace for Widen and Kennedy. And I noticed in the plans that it actually has outdoor workspace, and that it really involves in bringing in greenery. And also a project that uh, was done also for a museum 
was actually became a farm. And so that there's this transition from thinking about a museum as a space to go see art becomes a place where you grow things or a workspace where you think you're going to be working at an office desk ends up working outside. I'm wondering about the transitions that you find that you might think that the city is actually going through, uh, thanks to advanced technology, thanks to other types of innovation. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I think both Paul and Donald are exactly right in that, uh, on the one hand, uh, there are very practical and pragmatic issues that, that, that need to be considered. Uh, but on the other, I think uh, architects, you know, look to the past, but in a way to, to project alternate for the future. Uh, and so I think Donald is right, you know, work is changing, it's much more collaborative, it's, it's you know, the idea of the, the closed office is disappearing, uh, technology, your, your phone, uh, Uber, uh, you know, technology is changing uh, cities and how we, how we think of transportation. And I, I think what, uh, uh, what architects uh, can do is 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 sort of produce new kinds of desire, you know, and and uh, and say we don't have to live this way. Uh, how, you know, how are we going to live in such dense cities uh, if if we are not to uh, try to produce food in them or try to you know double up infrastructure to create uh, uh, to become architecture and to create new kinds of public space. So so we can come up with these uh, not so outrageous sometimes the real is moves much faster than architects can uh, can imagine it and so if we actually just analyze the real uh, we would find that some of the innovations are, are, are really changing uh, how how we can operate and so I think we can draw everything together uh, and I'm really uh, interested in the fact that you know a website is being launched uh, today and I think that that can really become talking about technology uh, a, a way to communicate with a much broader audience both local and 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 also uh, kind of beyond uh, to do two things on the one hand uh, illustrate some of the uh, uh, practical questions uh, look at precedents and case studies and uh, of course not just New York I mean uh, and historical I mean you showed historical images uh, uh, of the arcade and you know what what was the road before I think questions of uh, of climate change, of uh, rising uh, waters, uh, you know, I mean, all of these questions can can come and sort of uh, impact the design, and I think that uh, uh, or, or the imagination, and I think that the website has a role to play there in terms of reaching out. Uh, and creating an audience, uh, the audience isn't there yet. I mean, it's like it's starting today, and and that, that can be a, a conversation, a very open conversation that uh, sort of uh, allows for a sort of feedback loop uh, to be created. Well, I think our speakers have brought up a lot of uh, of issues and ideas already, and, and we want to leave time for questions. So maybe we should open the floor now for anybody who has any questions or comments. Have light, please. Uh, in the back. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to say thanks so much for uh, organizing okay. having this discussion because I think it's really important to talk about pedestrianization in Hong Kong. Um, so my question, there's two questions. Um, one, landscape architecture, as I know many of you. So uh, I'm a landscape architect and it would be really nice to have some focus on what actually is going to happen on the street because that for me is the most important part what actually is going, what is the design of the street? And then the second question, well, maybe that's just a statement, but uh, this question I would have, Paul, would be, has there been any discussion when you're talking about management and perhaps the creation of a, I don't know, rather than transport or highways, having some sort of uh, pedestrian or streetscape department, like something that actually might be created that could manage this, that might then move forward to discuss other opportunities? Streetscape department. Uh, the, the transport department used to have a uh, pedestrian uh, team and they cancelled it um, <laughs> because they had to respond to a planning department plans in 97, 2000 to do some pedestrianisation and they did some of the work and then they cancelled the department. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how we're going to solve it. I mean, uh, within the current environment in government in Hong Kong, um, 
it's so difficult to get anything done that it's probably better that we'll try to get a, an, a partnership between the people and the business uh, and then tag along government rather than try to focus on changing government because uh, then we're going to be here in 10 years' time and then we're all old and grey and then we still haven't fixed the problem. So um, so I think that, that I think we should focus on. Try to figure out how we can get a trust between the developers and the community about that street and then from there try to work forward and then try to t get the licensing authority, the food and hygiene department, to come with us on, on that one. Um, in terms of streetscape, I wanted to make a point of that one uh, very quickly. Edward Stokes, a photographer, some of them, uh, some of you will know him. Uh, I, he grabbed me and he called me up and he said, "I've got to talk to you about the Vaux Road." And then he showed me photographs of how filthy the Vaux Road is, how the f street furniture is broken, how the railings are bent, how the pavement is just disgusting. Um, how everything basically is a complete ugly mess. When you take a camera, you do close-ups, and it's like, and then you go like, you see how dirty and ugly this thing is? So, yeah, no, there's a great opportunity to take it from where it is today to make it, to go, to take it forward. And as long as you got more space and you take some traffic off, you can actually start doing that. Now, where you take it, <laughs> I don't know, you could take it anywhere then. Over to you guys. <laughs> I, I second the landscape element to it. I mean, I think that would be a great addition as well. I mean, just in all honesty, this is a fast, um, quite quickly evolving uh, entity that we are really starting to see that there's some changes happening within Hong, Hong Kong. We want to actually see if we can take part in it. But I think this is, as Eric Chen said, this is the beginning of the beginning. And so it's really this idea that we'll start to really expand and look out and to see what other types of people who can contribute uh, will contribute. And we ex fully expect contributions from across society. I mean, I was just thinking about the, the people who are in the um, who are on the panel, I mean, I think all of us really care about not just having our voices heard, but actually that's the thing that we don't care about. We actually want to have other voices heard and to find ways of forming the network in such that everyone could actually give and take their opinion as well. And I think we'll rely on a vast amount of disciplines. Uh, what makes this project really exciting is actually that there is no one discipline that can provide the solution and that we all need to, in some ways, work in, together in order to envision something that would then uh, solve so many different uh, ideas and potential. Alice. Yes, um, I have a question for the New York uh, speakers from Columbia. I'm having lived in New York for nine years, and the two very successful conservancies was the Central Park Conservancy, and then uh, subsequently, the High Line too. Also, I understand was a conservancy. So, can you talk? And, and, and a lot of it was from people. And to this day, Central Park Conservancy is um, has a very healthy budget, and people can help donate to that. So, can you talk about that model and uh, kind of enlighten some of the people here in Hong Kong about that model, the conservancy model? <laughs> I, I think you. You've got to Google that one. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that uh, one of the one of the interesting aspects in New York, but also in the U.S., is there's a very big culture of philanthropy, uh, and uh, and so and it's not all over the world. And so I I think that uh, what's you know great about uh, you know, creating an, a sort of coalition like this one and starting to engage the public is that you could probably start to build uh, these kinds of uh, desires to, to to kind of support. Uh, it happens. It happens that uh, that New York has a long kind of uh, tradition of that, and uh, it cuts both ways. You know, sometimes it feels like uh, you know government should do more and it should be, um, but. Uh, but I think that you know you have you want to start that culture somehow. Thank you, Richard Warren. Um, speaking of what Alice just raised, you also can point to the uh, Grand Central Partnership and the uh, Bryant Park uh, uh, organization, both of which, as I understand it, involve business uh, originally in a way that. Um, stepped in and 
played a role when government perhaps in New York City was unable or unwilling or you know unfocused in in doing so uh, it, it, why wait? Why not get the business community organized here and start fixing the street up and cleaning it up and helping to fund the planning now? Well, I think actually individual um, developers or businessmen already are you know, involved in various projects on their own to try to uh, rejuvenate and uh, renew the urban scenes. Um, again, I think what is lacking is a platform where collaborative efforts can join force together to do better. And I think this is the start of it. Uh, and also I believe that Hong Kong society does not lack resources. It's how those resources have been uh, allocated. If you look at government, uh, they give $100 million to each uh, district to improve the environment. right? And you know, those money can be used creatively or just being wasted. So as I think there is resources that we can use. And if we make use of those resources correctly, um, you know, we can do a lot. Yeah, so I agree with Donald on, on that point. I mean, the uh, uh, Chung Kong has fixed the streetscape around their building. Uh, Swai fixes Tong Chong Street. They fixes Star Street. Uh, uh, Hong Kong land has a lot of buildings in Central, so they've done a, a large area in Central, planted lots of trees, spent millions of dollars on it. Uh, so it's just kind of like how to mobilize that same willingness of the property owners along the Vaux Road, but in a way that the people agree to it. As we just seen in with New World for the center, the waterfront there, people didn't agree that New World was going to do it. But I must say, the focus was more on the fact that they wanted to manage and own the waterfront. So if we can separate the investment and the management, then uh, we can find a solution. There's a gentleman in front who's been trying to, and then we'll and, and then we'll work our way back again. As far as I can see, public response through the media. <clears throat> has been good. Everybody is in favor of it. Of course, if it uh, touches their own interests, then they would look at it again. But we uh, can see that people are in favor of change along the lines which have already been put forward by civic exchange. Now, uh, I used to be an urban counselor at one time, and uh, that makes me feel that the views suggested by Donald and uh, Paul uh, are pretty much down to earth. If we have a little a working committee, the important thing is to think of what we're trying to achieve in the main, and that is to uh, uh, make that particular area traffic free and preserve the tram line. And on that simple uh, concept, if the committee, the working committee, which we could set up, approach the uh, developers who are involved and also the people living in the area who are very concerned, who would like to see the improvement, uh, get their views first because these are the main stakeholders. Uh, and uh, then proceed from there because from that basic uh, understanding of the stakeholders' views, then you could go to the district councillors. District council, I, Paul, I don't know um, if there are one or two district councils involved in that area, but you've got to approach them. And not only that, you've got to um, find out which are the government departments 
are involved in that. Uh, and, sir, sorry, I, I, uh, I, I think all of your your, your words are, are, are very reasonable and, 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 and really well taken, and, and I think all of the, the panelists have, have really uh, talked about the importance of getting stakeholders uh, involved. I, 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 I want to, but because we're this, running out of time. My question is this, yeah. then. Would it be worthwhile to concentrate first on getting this committee going and getting the, the basic information which could help you to move forward? Okay, very quickly, uh, we got uh, three things going at the same time. We got the Hong Kong Institute of Planners. Where are you? Benson, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong Institute of Planners, Benson, uh, young, young, the Young Planners, and YY. Uh, and Civic Exchange are working uh, towards, Civic Exchange in the room, uh, they're working towards on the, on, uh, the Transport Department, the Transport and Housing Bureau, uh, so the groups uh, that is um, here, we got Friends of the Earth in the room, I believe. Here you go, Friends of the Earth is right here. Uh, and we got Clean Air Networks right there in the back of the room. And who else is part of the team? Um, and Designing Hong Kong, <laughs> thank you. So those groups are kind of working on trying to get mobilizing public support and Knight Frank and the commercial, the China real estate chamber of commerce is in the room, and they are trying. They are thinking about how to get the owners and developers involved. So we have kind of like three strands organized. I see the night Frank in the room too, and the second ahead. So we got three strands organized of, uh, and we hope that everybody starts doing their thing. And the fourth strand is, of course, trying to get the design studios going. Uh, first on this level and then on another level. So I think we're trying to get organized. What's, um, the, what's the next step then, Paul, from your point of view? Get raise funds. While the design <laughs> studios do their things, we're going to raise some money because we're going to need to, what, I, t I tell you what we need to do. We need to spend money on getting the technical traffic transport study sorted out so that we convince the transport department. We've got to give them the tools to do the things that they need to do. So. And we cannot wait for go, government to go to let's go get money. So we have to raise the funds and go and do that. Why not make Donald fundraising chairman? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Donald. <laughs> Poor Donald. Uh, he's a good cause. No I mean, good there will be a lot of support. <laughs> Donald, no, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> don't, don't forget. Um, I, I'm really sorry, but... Um, we have to get uh, Amal, Jeffrey, and Eric to Hong Kong. You, because poor Amal has to give a lecture there uh, at at, at six thirty. Uh, so we'll we'll, we'll 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 sadly have to have to end this here. But uh, I think some of the speakers will still be around. Um, I, I, you all uh, probably know how to reach us. Uh, you certainly do now with the launch of DVRC.hk, where there is a PayPal function, by the way, so <laughs> every bit helps. So we want to thank, uh, first of all, Asia Society for, for co-organizing co this uh, with us, uh, Alice and her team, obviously the, the speakers uh, and, uh, and all of you. And uh, again, please, please keep, uh, keep involved and keep in touch and, uh, and, and, and uh, let's, let, let's see what happens. Thank you very much.